welcome along to another selection of letters sent from around the planet by members of the Mark Stein Club on lots of big picture subjects, but a couple of smaller things too we'll try and get to. This first one is from David Elstrom. Uh, here's an item I'd like to hear your views on. At least in the USA, almost every problem of overbearing and hyper nannyish government begins with the fact that the modern regulatory state was specifically designed by progressives to work around the Constitution's separation of powers and amendment process, as well as its requirement that laws originate in Congress. Once the elite masterminds can skip these representative safeguards, they can start running things by diktat. Uh, perhaps you can help me understand how the same problem arises in a parliamentary system, where in principle the entire government is contained in the representative body. That's a very interesting question. I talk about it uh, at length in my book, uh, After America, because we're more sophisticated than the uh, banana republics where they have a president for life who stays in office uh, until the next president for life has him carried out from the presidential palace by the handles. We're more sophisticated than that uh, in the Western world since the Second World War. You don't need a president for life. You don't need a president for life if you've got a bureaucracy for life. And that's what we have, as you can see in President Trump's uh, battles with the bureaucracy right now. And the agencies that David Elstrom is referring to are people like the Environmental Protection Agency, who can wreck your life if you have a little bit of patch of grass and it rains heavily and they declare it a wetlands, you're screwed. You have no property rights over that. And you think to yourself, well, where do I go to vote out the uh, EPA administrator and the EPA bureaucrats? You can't. Uh, when uh, Trump got elected, it was said that uh, at the EPA, uh, uh, dozens of bureaucrats actually burst into tears. And uh, I would have been in favor of declaring their face a wetlands and preventing them doing anything with that. Uh, but the fact is that uh, these uh, regulatory agencies have, have been generally impervious uh, to the controls uh, of representative government. And they're, and they're pushing back against the elected re representatives in, uh, in uh, disturbing ways. Their view is they're the permanent government and there's these little passing transient figures called politicians who come and go every couple of years, but the permanent government goes on. Uh, since David asked how it works in parliamentary systems, it's not really any better. I'll give you an example about that. When I got into trouble with the human rights commissions up in Canada, where they attempted, in effect, to criminalize my writing, uh, with the result that uh, had I lost those cases, I would have been subject to a de facto lifetime publication ban in my own country. And when I mentioned it in American newspapers, I used to get letters saying, uh, you know what you need to do, Stein? You need to get a conservative government elected in Canada, and uh, then they'll take charge of all this stuff and prevent it from happening. Uh, what <laughs> my naive American friends didn't realize was at that point, Canada had a conservative government under a conservative prime minister who had appointed a conservative uh, justice minister who had in turn appointed a conservative head of the Human Rights Commission. And none of that made any difference because as one cabinet minister said to me over dinner back then, the trouble is uh, once you have big government, there are never enough conservatives uh, to appoint to all the positions you need to fill. You, you, you've got enough for the key positions, and then when you get down to the agency of this and the bureau of that and all the rest of it, you're starting to deal with some very wobbly, squishy people because basically not a lot of conservatives want to work for the government. So by nature, big government bureaucracies uh, will tilt left. You cannot really have, once government gets to a certain size, you cannot really have a uh, conservative government. And I think this is, this is a real issue uh, for the Western world 
uh, at the start of the 21st century. Um, but the bureaucratic state, the inability to uh, put restraints on the bureaucracy uh, is one of the most disturbing elements. And in America, it's particularly bad uh, because uh, Obama basically weaponized the Justice Department and uh, the IRS. And once you've got a weaponized Justice Department and Revenue Collection Agency, you're basically heading toward Banana Republic territory. Um, and people think, well, okay, now we've had a change of government. Presumably they're not like that. Actually, you know, the evidence is that uh, the pushback at uh, the Justice Department, uh, the IRS, uh, even the spooks in the deep state, uh, that the, the bureaucracy is undermining uh, the elected representatives, and that's not a healthy thing. David Elstrom, thank you for that question. Mark Ferrigno goes, Mark, we've been slogging along in Afghanistan for 16 years now. I've enjoyed your writings about the brutal Afghan winter that was going to beat the snot out of and lose the war for the Americans. Seems to me it's been too many years since you have uttered the words brutal Afghan winter. Is it time for an Afghan weather update? Thanks, uh, Mark Ferrigno. Now, uh, Mark's referring to the fact that uh, at the time uh, America first went into Afghanistan in the fall of 2001, people were running around like headless chickens saying, oh, uh, we've only got a couple of weeks uh, to impose our will upon Afghanistan before the brutal Afghan winter will make things impossible. The brutal Afghan winter will start foreclosing options. The brutal Afghan winter. So uh, at some point... Uh, this is in my book, The Undocumented Mark Stein. It's uh, book plugs a go-go on this particular show. Uh, the brutal Afghan winter. So one day I decided to look up the temperatures. And it was freezing cold wherever I was sitting in northern New Hampshire. I think it was about, uh, you know, 15 below or whatever it was. And it was balmy and 43 in Afghanistan. And in fact, the brutal Afghan winter isn't that brutal. We've lost in Afghanistan. Uh, but we didn't lose because of the weather. If it was just a question of beating the weather, uh, we would have won. And actually, if it was just a question of beating ragtag armies, uh, we would have won. But instead, we've stayed there now for 16 years. 16 years. Uh, and 24 hours after the last Western soldier leaves, it will be as if we were never there. Uh, in After America, I quote a Kenyan journalist who says that uh, wars are always bad, uh, conquests are always bad, but it's better if your uh, invading army comes from the West, because at least then they'll leave you with some good roads and all the rest of it. There's not a lot of evidence we did a lot of road building in Afghanistan. And in a sense, that's not what we were there for. Um, Americans are not imperial. I'm an, basically a 19th century imperialist, uh, 100 years past my sell-by date. Uh, and the reason I'm imperialist is because uh, if you're going to stay 16 years, you ought to have a reason for doing it. A 16-year policing operation is really a big uh, waste of time. There was a fellow I noticed, I, I'm at that stage in my life where I like to read the obituary columns, and I noticed the other day that a fellow called uh, Sir Duncan McMullen had died. And Sir Duncan uh, was a judge from New Zealand. And like many uh, judges of his generation, he served not only on the New Zealand Court of Appeal, but also on the Cook Islands Court of Appeal and the Fiji Court of Appeal. Uh, for anyone born in the Commonwealth of his generation, that's not a particularly unusual career trajectory. One moment you're a judge in New Zealand, next minute you're a judge in Fiji. No, there is no American judge who wants to go and sit on the Kandahar District Court. Americans don't have an imperialist bone in their bodies. It's not in their DNA, and that's fine. I accept that. But in that case, why run around Afghanistan for 16 years? You know, 16 years, it's, it's interesting to me. Uh, the Kingdom of Sarawak, 
they're not that far from Afghanistan as one looks at these things if you're spinning the globe. Uh, but it was run by the Brook family, who were known as the White Rajas of Sarawak. And then in 1946, it all got a bit wobbly. And uh, the British government decided to make Sarawak a crown colony, and it passed within His Majesty's dominions. 1946. 1963, Sarawak became part of the independent nation of Malaysia. So in other words, that's all it took. 17 years as a crown colony within uh, Her Majesty's dominions uh, for Sarawak uh, to proceed from this kind of ramshackle state uh, to independence as part of Malaysia. 17 years. America will have been in Afghanistan longer than Sarawak was a crown colony of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth II uh, within a few months. And what's been accomplished? As I said, you know, uh, if you're not going to be an imperialist, then you can do two things. You can do what uh, John Derbyshire calls the rubble doesn't cause trouble strategy. The Taliban catch your eye. Osama catches your eye. You go and bomb the hell out of them and then say, you catch our eye again, we're going to bomb the hell out of you again. But to spend 16 years running around Afghanistan, uh, the, the NATO occupation is responsible for 98% of the Afghan economy. And as I said, 24 hours after the last Western soldier leaves, it will be as if we were never there. I can make the case for imperialism. I can't make the case for being an ineffectual global traffic cop. <clears throat> uh, Stephen Mack says, uh, I continue to grind my teeth and rend my garments over the cliche statements that police have not yet determined a motive after an Islamist blows something up while yelling Allahu Akbar. Of course, the concept of Muslims being terrorists is being studiously avoided. Yet there is a genuine and perhaps subtle question of motivation. What is being achieved by these acts? Obviously, the act attacks are not an existential threat to Western civilization in and of themselves. But what are they? What is the message being sent? Who's the recipient? One thought is that the recipients are us Westerners, the, messenger, the message being, I am Islam, hear me roar. To me, that answer is unsatisfactory. I believe that acts of terrorism, particularly Islamic ones, are a form of virtue signaling by Muslim to Muslim, a way of saying Allahu Akbar at maximum possible volume. Actually, I'd say they're more, the practical effect of terror is as an opportunity of virtue signaling for us. I think it's very clear. We, we say after an act of terror that they'll never change us. No, Prime Minister, stand up and say they will never change us. Tim Blair in the Sydney Daily Telegraph did an excellent column the other day uh, just looking at how hideously ugly the centres of Australian cities are becoming. Uh, the whole of Australia is being bollardized, bollards everywhere uh, to prevent vehicles coming up, up onto the sidewalk and killing people. They're showing the uh, Tim showed the security at some Aussie footy stadium where there's going to be a big match. Uh, 80,000 people got to get in there. Uh, so they're tightening security so it can't be like the Ariana Grande thing. I don't even get that because the Ariana Grande guy blew up the uh, people leaving. He waited at the edge of the security perimeter and then blew that up because it's easy. Uh, so they do change us. They make going to a pop concert or a football match or a restaurant or crossing a bridge on the River Thames different or internal travel within the United States hellish. They change us, they change us, they change us. Um, but in my speech at the Danish Parliament on the 10th anniversary of the Mohammed cartoons, I quoted uh, a, a great Canadian, George Jonas, who said that terrorism's great achievement isn't hijacking jetliners but hijacking the debate. Successful terrorism persuades the terror-stricken that he's conscience-stricken. And that's very subtle, but it's true. They change the instinct from uh, to be terrified uh, into a reflex to see things from the other fellow's point of view. 
And you see this all over the Western world now. This is what this is what these terror attacks accomplish. Uh, they 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 change us not because they make us frightened, but because they make us feeble and passive, uh, and they impose conditions on us whereby our reaction to being blown up is to stand around and hold hands and wave flowers and sing Imagine, and that's actually quite a victory. Uh, and I'm not sure it isn't an existential threat to the West. Uh, when you can blow people up, and after it's happened the third, fourth, fifth, sixth time, everybody takes it as natural that the way to react to it is to hold a flower, sing songs, clutch teddy bears. That actually uh, is an existential threat if that's who we're becoming. It's a kind of form of brainwashing. Uh, and they've been very clever. They've been very clever at that. Fran Lavery writes, I have a burning question for your Q&A. In the context of the British legal system, do the Sharia courts have any legitimacy? And if so, why the hell does the British legal system allow it? There are, uh, I believe, about 100 Sharia courts operating in the United Kingdom. These are Islamic courts functioning within the birthplace of English common law. Uh, and you, you say, Fran, why, why has that been allowed to happen? Well, in free countries, people have a certain latitude in, uh, in settling disputes their own way. For example, uh, if you do business in America, it may well be a contractual obligation that if you run into a dispute over the contract, you have to settle it through arbitration rather than going to a courthouse. And there's an American Arbitration Association and a couple of other ones that have rules and things. Uh, and so instead of going to the district courthouse, uh, you'll go and sit in a room somewhere across the table uh, and uh, an arbitrator will preside over it. And you will, in effect, uh, engage in a quasi-judicial process outside the court system. And you have a lot more uh, latitude to agree conditions that would be problematic in court. So if you and I got into a dispute and at the end of it we reached an agreement where you have to walk around with uh, purple knickers on your head and I have to walk around with a pink brassiere hanging off the end of my nose, well, we've reached that dispute in arbitration and so it's not the business of some judge in a county courthouse. And that's really to look at it in a benign way, what a Sharia court is. It's two freeborn citizens supposedly agreeing to resolve their differences in an alternative venue uh, to the local courthouse. What's repulsive about it is that for half the population, i.e. women, uh, they're generally forced by their men into this alternative court system. And once they're in it, the guys who make the decisions, the so-called judges, are, are guys. Uh, so if you're a woman who wants to resolve her marital problems uh, within the Sharia court system, you're not going to get a, a, a great deal out of it. Uh, so in the end, Sharia law is not like uh, the American Arbitration Association. It's a bridgehead. It's seeded into uh, the United Kingdom uh, for those huge numbers of people who actually want to live under Sharia law in the West. And they've taken various polls about this. It's whatever it is, 37% in Ireland, 40% uh, in England and Wales. It's the same pretty much all over the place. There are uh, there is a huge percentage of Muslims who want to live under Sharia law, and this is, in a way, uh, is a way of establishing within self-segregating Muslim communities the fact that even the uh, bedrock principle of English law, which is equality before the law, does not apply to Muslim women. You're right that they're disgraceful, and they shouldn't be there. Uh, I wanted to uh, do a, a, a couple of, well, we can't just do total civilizational collapse all the time, so I want to do a couple of things, lighter things before we go. Uh, Lawrence Budner writes, there was a genre of popular songs set to melodies from classical music. Are you especially fond of any of them? 
I was thinking about the minimal exposure kids get to classical music now and how they wouldn't even get that these songs were allusions to famous pieces. Uh, and he makes the point that classical music is declining. Could you imagine a political commentator, he says, who combines trenchant conservative analysis with Bach and Beethoven? You're referring to, it was a genre that really uh, got going in the mid-20th century uh, where people would put lyrics essentially to great classical tunes. Uh, uh, Chopin, uh, I'm Always Chasing Rainbows, Ravel, uh, The Lamp is Low, Borodin, Bauble, Spangles and Beads and uh, Stranger in Paradise. I, I talked to Wrighton Forrest who helped turn uh, Borodin's uh, Palozzi and Dances into uh, Stranger in Paradise. And the middle section of that, which is the best bit, is actually, they resented it being credited to Borodin because they wrote that themselves, because they'd run out of Borodin by that point in the song. And um, yeah, I do like them, actually. I do like them. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Chabri, Espana, and I love Espana. It's a fabulous piece. Perry Como in the 50s turned Chabrier's Espana into hot diggity dog ziggity boom what you do to me, which is not what Chabrier had in mind, but is hard to resist. I think the last example of this was in the 70s when Eric Carmen had a, took a little bit of Rachmaninoff and uh, had a hit with uh, All By Myself. And in the 90s, there was a movie you may remember called Mr. Holland's Opus in which uh, Mr. Holland was played by Richard Dreyfus, who was a music teacher. And there's a scene there where he's got a bunch of bored kids. It's set in the 60s. And he can't get them interested in classical music. And his way to do it is to take a hit from the mid-60s uh, called uh, Lover's Concerto by The Toys. And that was actually bit, uh, based on an old bit of Bach. And so he plays them the pop song based on Bach, and they get interested in Bach. And you can't do that now. You can't do that now. In fact, one of the saddest aspects of life is that in schools, uh, even the music teachers aren't interested in classical music. And uh, if you're not interested in classical music by the time you leave school, it's very hard to pick it up uh, afterwards. Um, I said I wasn't going to get into civilizational collapse, but actually I think that is kind of part of civilizational collapse. On a, on a same, similar note, Dan Hollam writes from Los Angeles. Dan uh, sent me a wonderful bit of uh, Quebecois Franco pop that I hadn't heard in a few years uh, called the Plattsburgh Drive-In Blues, uh, which we did for one of our Canadian songs of the day a couple of days ago. And as a postscript to that, Dan Hollam uh, uh, actually, I've given him a bit of a Quebecois pronunciation there, Dan Olom. I think it's Hollum. Uh, but Dan says, for some reason, I've always been much more music than lyric oriented and I've always had a fondness for great distinctive instrumentals. This would include most of Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, Booker T and the MGs, things like Summer Samba, Swing and Safari, A Walk in the Black Forest, Soul Coaxing, etc., no matter which oldies forum I post in, I'm pretty much always the only person whose favorite Burt Bacharach tune is Casino Royale. And, um, you know, I go, I blow, I kind of understand where Dan is coming from. Uh, many years ago, the great lyric writer, Sammy Kahn, he wrote Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, and uh, Come Fly With Me and My Kind of Town Chicago Is. And he said to me, I can't hear two words of in two bars of instrumental music without wanting to put words to it. And I I've been through phases like that where the minute you hear any kind like those classical tunes, the minute you hear any tune, you start thinking about what words could go on top of it. But I must say, uh, particularly these days, uh, as I get more stressed out by the impending collapse of civilization and by my own legal woes. I find when I'm stressed, uh, I incline more to instrumental music. And um, uh, when I'm totally stressed out, I, I just like to hear uh, chamber music. I don't really like anything after about 1800. But when I'm just mar I'm partially relaxed, I can handle uh, lyrics. When I'm sort of semi-stressed, semi-relaxed, I really like some of those things that uh, Dan mentioned, great 60s instrumentals. The things like Swing and Safari he mentioned are by Bert Camford. He mentioned Bert Bacharach, Casino Royale. 
Bert Camfort Swingin' Safari. You want to have a great time? Find a 60s instrumental by a guy called Bert, uh, and you can't go wrong. And I, I was thinking about it, I was driving along with my kid, and he was complaining that they never got to play any great charts like this uh, in their high school band. We had it cranked up listening to some, I forget what it was, Lalo Schifrin or Neil Hefty or Quincy Jones, some terrific 60s uh, instrumental. And uh, often of actually quite undistinguished tunes, like uh, a lot of the Rocky stuff at the time. People would do like great instrumentals of Come On Baby, Light My Fire and things. And uh, I, said to, I said to my son, you should listen to these because this is a lost art. I actually think the art of uh, orchestration, pop orchestration, peaked in the 1960s. And uh, it's, one of, it's part of that lost historical knowledge that I occasionally talk about. So uh, I've, uh, I've worked my way around from jihad and bureaucracies for life and said we were going to end on a light note, but even talking about swinging 60s instrumentals, uh, I see I've come round to civilizational collapse too. Keep this stuff alive. It's bad that people haven't a clue about Bach. It's bad they haven't a clue about Bert Camfort too. We are witnessing the death of huge portions of our civilizational inheritance. Go listen to Swingin' Safari. That's what is going to keep our civilization alive. We'll see you next time.